Well, it's a real privilege uh, to, to be back here, actually, with you all. Um, and uh, I see that you've been preaching through 1 Corinthians, and uh, so it happened that uh, my week fell on the week that you're going to preach about singleness. So I'll be able to share as a single uh, from uh, some of the things that have really helped me over the years from this chapter. The first thing I actually want to do is recommend just two resources that have been really a great help to me. One is a book by Sam Albury called Seven Myths of Singleness. Uh, just goes through some, some great insights about the difficulties of singleness, uh, our sexuality, um, sometimes our perceived lack of family and intimacy, uh, and the idea of a special calling, which I don't think there really is one to singleness. But um, uh, another one is The Meaning of Singleness. That's a book released recently by Danny Trawick. She's maybe Australia's uh, expert theologian uh, on Christian singleness. She's just finished her PhD on it. She's written a book. Um, she also helps to run a great organisation called Single Minded. Those resources have helped me as well. So I've definitely had my ups and downs with singleness uh, over the years and maybe one day I'll get married. I don't know, but I, I remember I used to really want to get married and have a family. Uh, I'm, I guess I'm just less sure about that now. But I've come to enjoy some of the incredible opportunities and privileges that come with being single. Uh, and I've also experienced some of the grief of relationships that didn't work out. So today's talk, I just hope that I can be really sensitive to uh, all of the different life circumstances that some of us find ourselves in. And this chapter, 1 Corinthians 7, is probably the preeminent chapter, really, in the Bible uh, that speaks to the issues of singleness. So uh, it's been something that has helped me many times over the years, and I'll just hit on a few of the sections in the chapter that relate especially. I think the first thing we learn is that singleness is a gift and so is marriage. That's in verses 7 to 10. So Paul starts with, I wish or that all of you were as I am. Well, from the biblical evidence, we can kind of work out that maybe Paul was married in the past, but he's definitely single as he writes this chapter. And so he goes on to say, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now, some people have kind of interpreted the word gift uh, along with a couple of phrases later in the passage about sexual desires and the struggles that we have with them to say that what Paul is referring to here is kind of a gift uh, of a special coping ability to, um, to cope with as a single of overcoming sexual temptation. And that's partly because the Greek word charisma is used of spiritual gifts elsewhere in the Bible. But the thing is, that word is also used of uh, presence or blessings from God. Things like uh, God's grace, uh, answered prayer, uh, and also eternal life are, are gifts or presents to us from God. So I actually think this uh, interpretation of some people talk about the gift of singleness is severely lacking. Uh, because in the chapter, in just in the chapter prior to that, Paul says, um, if single people uh, need to a special ability to cope with sexual temptation, then why does he say that all people need to flee uh, sexual immorality? Or just a couple of uh, chapters later in chapter 10, he says that he gives us, he will not tempt us beyond what we are able, uh, he will not let us be tempted, sorry, God doesn't tempt people, he will not let us be tempted above what we are able, but he will give us a way to endure the temptation. And so, um, do, uh, do singles need a supernatural power more than the Holy Spirit? Uh, I also think that, you know, what about married people? Because the evidence suggests that actually uh, sex within marriage is not the cure-all remedy for uh, sexual temptation, but actually we all need self-control, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to overcome this. Um, in fact, I think I probably know a few people who would be quite interested to hear if there was a, a gift uh, to cope with marriage. Um, so uh, I think finally also this view denies the goodness of singleness itself. Uh, I think it sort of says singleness is such an undesirable state that it almost requires a superpower to cope with it. Uh, so it seems like actually the best interpretation of what Paul is trying to say is that singleness and marriage are both wonderful presents or blessings 
from God. That is, none of us as Christians are missing out. So even though there are challenges, we all receive the goodness of God. Married people, they have privileges of marriage, but uh, they actually are deprived of some of the blessings of singleness. And singleness, we enjoy certain opportunities and privileges that married people don't have. So how do we know when we actually view singleness like God does, as, as a gift and a blessing? Uh, just a few practical things I've been helping uh, thinking about. So one is that I think we will show hospitality and inclusion towards people of all ages, uh, as well as couples and families. So I'm very thankful uh, in my church at North to be going to a weekly discipleship group which is hosted in a family's home. And, and I get to, uh, to be there early and just kind of do some art with the kids and uh, read them stories. Uh, it's just a great involvement. And I'm thankful to other couples that invite me along to uh, their couples' events, even though I don't have a partner. So I'm really grateful for the way that people look out for singles. And I think it's partly our responsibility as singles to kind of get involved in the Christian community and not criticise others. So to work out how we can be sensitive to family needs, but kind of come along as an unofficial auntie or uncle and kind of help out with uh, the family. I think we value singleness as a blessing from God when we stop presuming that an older person who is single has to be divorced or same-sex attracted or miserable or have something wrong with them. Um, we can really make some terrible assumptions sometimes. Uh, here's another challenging one. Um, I think we appreciate singleness as a blessing from God when we start praying for marriage or singleness for our children. Uh, and I think this actually changes our language. Uh, sometimes we can unconsciously say, uh, when you get married one day, when perhaps we should say, if you get married one day, and not set up false expectations. And I think we value singleness when we teach our children about the privileges of serving God as a single or a married person, that God has a place for all of us. Now, in this chapter, Paul covers reasons why singles might pursue marriage and also reasons to think very carefully about pursuing marriage. So, uh, one of them is the lack of se sexual self-control. He says in verses 8 and 9, I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it's good for them if they remain as I am. But if they do not have self-control, they should marry, since it's better to marry than to burn with desire. Now, unmarried here probably actually refers to those who have been married previously, but the advice is helpful for all singles. So Paul says, if you don't have sexual self-control, then it's better to marry than to burn desire, or in other ways, to burn with sexual uh, passion where you have no means to deal with it. So if it's a choice between sinful singleness and marriage, then uh, the Christian should pursue marriage, if possible. Uh, where those sexu sexual desires can be satisfied legitimately. But sin is to be avoided above all. So what Paul is not saying is if you have sexual urges, then marry. We all have sexual urges. That's the way God has made us in his image. Um, instead, I think Paul is saying if you've been sinning sexually, whether that's physically or maybe through pornography, uh, you need to take steps to get help. Maybe some steps towards marriage, but choose carefully because it's a lifelong commitment. So I deliberately said um, take steps towards marriage if you can because I know that that's not always possible for many of us. So some of us, we don't have the opportunity because uh, maybe we're same-sex attracted or maybe we haven't been asked out on a date uh, or we haven't been asked to marry or maybe uh, we've tried asking others out but have been refused uh, and all of these things actually bring a lot of grief, loss, and pain. And so there's many legitimate reasons for not being able to find a suitable life partner, even if you really want one. So what about those then who are struggling with sexual desire, but don't have an opportunity to marry, or maybe marriage is not currently a an option for us? Well, I think the real solution in this passage here is not marriage, but self-control. So all Christians are actually called to the same sexual ethics, sexual faithfulness within 
biblical marriage or without or outside of biblical marriage being uh, faithfully celibate. Uh, sexual temptations, they don't disappear when you get married. And so self-control is something we all need to have as followers of Jesus. And it's about an earnest desire to follow Jesus, uh, to form good habits and to get help. I think we also need to hear uh, a reminder about how essential sex is because our culture tells us that sex is absolutely essential to your well-being and to your health and actually you're not really living the good life if sex isn't a part of your life. But the Bible says that's a lie. The Bible upholds the goodness of sex and a marriage uh, and the goodness of our sexual desires but it says sex is not essential. So the most flourishing and fully human being that ever lived with Jesus and he was a virgin. So it doesn't actually also take very much effort to look through our extensive Christian history and see there's been a lot of single people who have had sexual desires but they have put all of their energy into blessing and building the kingdom of God. Uh, So singles may miss out on sex but we never miss out on the best that God has for our lives. So yes, um, you might say, I know about, other, uh, about Jesus and faithful singles, but what about me and my struggles with sexual sin? Uh, I've just got two things that have helped me over the years. Uh, one thing I think we need is deep, vulnerable, supportive friendships. Uh, that kind of friendship is actually hard to come by and you need to work at it. Um, Sam Albury actually helped me to see that in the West, we kind of collapse sex and intimacy into the one, uh, and so we associate the word intimacy with sex. Uh, But we kind of know that that's not true, because hookup culture says that you can get a lot of sex without much intimacy. And so the reverse is true. We We can have intimacy without sex, and that comes through solid Christian friendships, A bit like Proverbs says, a friend who sticks closer than one of your own siblings um, through the struggles. So you need to find someone who isn't sort of a little bit icky uh, about your struggles uh, um, and as you go through life, who actually is willing to listen and help you to become more like Jesus. Uh, You need someone who you can pour out your heart to and as James 5.16 says, we Uh, confess our sins one to another and pray for one another. So we aren't supposed to struggle alone in our Christian life. And sometimes that was the key for me is I had friendships, but I didn't go down into detail into any of my secret sins. Uh, So now that's something that's really helped me is uh, I have a friend who uh, I shared my secret uh, struggle with sexual lust and now we pray for each other and we help each other. Um, and it's just so comforting to know that I can uh, really open my, my life up to this guy. And, of course, we pray for our obvious sins as well. There's many of those. Um, but another thing I think we need is actually personal boundaries. Um, now, this is going to vary a little bit, but boundaries is not a legalistic thing. Boundaries are just tools that you put in place to help you think twice so that you don't sin by impulse. So uh, there, there's going to be a lot of variation. For some people, it might be they have certain things that they can't watch with media. Uh, for me, actually, I've found accountability software really helpful because it just helps me think twice about what I'm looking at. Um, so while Paul uh, highlights the goodness of marriage here and in other chapters, you know, such as Ephesians 5, uh, he also cautions us about putting ma- uh, marriage on too much of a pedestal. Um, The Bible holds singleness and marriage as both as equally good, but uh, in this chapter there's three more cautions that I just want to go through. So one is that um, changing your status won't fix your life. Uh, This is true of singleness and marriage. Uh, In some ways Paul is actually speaking to people who thought singleness was maybe more holy uh, or more spiritual. But he's saying, if you're discontent with your current status, married or single, don't think that changing your status is going to make you more content. That point is emphasised three times. Um, Here's the one from verse 24. Brothers and sisters, each person is to remain with God in the situation in which he was called. So he's not saying that we shouldn't desire marriage. 
Uh, but he's reminding us that when you're in the family of Christ, your status does not actually have spiritual significance. Uh, and that's what Paul shares in Galatians 3.28. There is no better status to be Jew or Greek, uh, slave or free, male or female, we're all one in Jesus Christ. So all the maybe so- social, cultural, ethnic things that have brought you status in your past, uh, they're actually worth nothing in terms of the relationships within the kingdom of God. Uh, in this new life, we're actually all one together due to the gospel. Circumcision was a huge symbol of belonging in Paul's time. But he says in verse 19, circumcision doesn't matter and uncircumcision doesn't matter. Um, The gospel brings the Jews and the non-Jews together. Paul even says, don't even let slavery trouble you. Uh, So if you have the opportunity to get freedom, he says, go for it. Now, we find uh, this kind of awkward. Why wouldn't Paul speak out more against slavery? Uh, We don't really have time to duck into that today, but just a few things. One is that I think our idea of slavery um, is quite different to the the common Roman slavery. So in many Roman households, being a slave was more like uh, being a member of the household. And that's why Romans would, uh, people would put themselves in slavery because they might be able to gain Roman citizenship or pay off a debt. Um, But then I think the Bible speaks really strongly against slavery. You think of the number one motif of salvation in the Old Testament, it is God rescuing the Israelites from slavery. And even in the New Testament, what's a big picture of our whole Christian lives? We are set free from slavery to sin. So this just means that, getting back to the passage, that the way we view life success uh, in God's kingdom Marriage is a lateral move. It might fulfil social expectations uh, of your friends, maybe even your church, but in, uh, because you're sort of uh, doing what uh, a normal person would do, but you don't actually become more valuable in the kingdom of God. And so Paul and Jesus' teaching on this was radically countercultural for their time because for the Jews... Uh, they've, they valued uh, marriage, but maybe put an overemphasis on it because marriage brought you connections um, socially, but it also brought you children. And children gave you things like your uh, retirement plan, uh, employees for the, for the, for the, um, the family business, uh, and children also sort of were a symbol of the blessing of God. But uh, this emphasis on family bloodlines uh, in the Old Testament... Uh, it does, does not feature um, uh, as strongly. We still value children. Children are a blessing from God, but it's a totally different emphasis in the New Testament. So then it's really worth uh, how we think, um, thinking about how we think about marriage. So if you're, if you're single and you're maybe holding off on big decisions in your life because you think, well, I'll just wait until marriage... I just want to say, just be careful waiting because God doesn't necessarily promise marriage. Um, So it's possible that God has planned singleness for you, for your good, even though you might disagree, but to to get on uh, with your life and follow Jesus um, and make sacrificial decisions for his kingdom. So we don't become more spiritual by changing our circumstances, not by becoming a pastor, not by becoming poor, And I'm very sad and heartbroken to say you don't even become spiritual by becoming a missionary. Uh, So if your status doesn't really matter, then what matters? Well, keeping God's command is what matters, is what Paul says in verse 19. I think this is a really helpful reminder for us not to overemphasize sexual sin. Now, what I'm not saying is I'm not minimizing sexual sin. Um, The Bible says it's very serious. 1 Corinthians 6 says... Uh, Our sins, they have an outward effect on our relationships with God and our relationships with people, Uh, and that includes sexual immorality, has that effect, but in addition, sexual sins, they have a sin that is against our own body. That is, it's against the very nature and purpose of our bodies, which are supposed to be temples of God in which the, the Holy Spirit dwells. 
So what I'm saying is I just think that sometimes we can actually have too big a focus on sexual sin and forget about all the other areas in our lives where God wants to overcome other kinds of sin. So something I've been thinking through recently is, uh, you know, the passage in Galatians 5 about the fruit of the Spirit. Well, just prior to that, there's a list of kind of sins that we struggle with. And here's some questions I've been asking myself. What or who has my attention more than Jesus? Does the way Jesus lived a life of serving others show me my life is selfish in a particular area? Would, kingdom, uh, would God look at my budget and affirm that I am being radically generous for the sake of his kingdom? And other things I say bringing others down or do I seek at all time to build others up in love? The next section in verses 25 to 31 cautions against marrying for reasons other than status. So we could actually call them short-term and long-term situational factors. So Paul now writes to virgins and historically that's been uh, uh, women that maybe their, their father wants to kind of uh, find someone to an arrange a marriage with. But um, recent commentators think maybe it's about actually pe- women who are already engaged and they're worrying with this present distress that Paul talks about whether to continue with the marriage. And so Paul says there's some sort of crisis happening uh, and that, that's why he's advising people who, are go- who want to get married to just delay. Uh, some say the crisis actually could be the second coming of Jesus. Uh, Because of a few things in the passage where it says the world in its current form is passing away and the time is limited. And so there were many Christians in the first century which thought Jesus would come back uh, very soon, within a hundred years of his passing. But we also know that there was actually a famine around the time that Paul wrote this letter from Corinth in AD 51. So I actually think there's two streams of timeline going on here, the current and the eternal. And this is actually how we should be making our decisions all the time, taking into account our current situations, but also thinking long-term into the future. How is this going to affect eternity? So uh, in the short term, you might delay marriage due to reasons uh, of uh, financial reasons or maybe uh, your your family situation uh, or even spiritual maturity. But I think Paul is also saying you might decide to legitimately choose not to marry at all because you're so passionate about God's kingdom and the eternal perspective. Uh, From a missions perspective, uh, married and single people go overseas uh, all the time, Um, but he's told us to reach people groups with the gospel and the the big thing is that 40% of the world currently has uh, are starving for the gospel, basically, the, the amount of access that they have and the lack of witnesses of Jesus. And so in Matthew 19, Jesus actually talks about people being single, uh, reasons for them being single. And the first two are involuntary. The, the singles haven't chosen to be single. But the last one is someone choosing uh, to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. So in general terms, though, this is actually maybe a a reminder for us to think, to get things into perspective um, and think about eternal things. You know, do you find yourself actually focusing more on the TV series that you're watching or the sports team that you follow more than uh, thinking about how you can impact your neighbour, relative uh, and show them hospitality or the love of Jesus in their life? Or when it comes to singles, sometimes we're actually more concerned about a single person's loneliness than the fact that they're actually wasting their life. Uh, There's another factor that Paul cautions against when you consider marriage, and that's of extra complications and anxieties. Twice it says, the unmarried person is concerned about the things of the Lord, but the married person is concerned about the things of the world. So Paul is definitely not saying that married people aren't concerned about pleasing the Lord. He's saying that married people have legitimate additional responsibilities uh, to juggle as they please the Lord compared with a single person. So serving your spouse and your children are a great way to serve in the kingdom of God. That's what you should be doing. Uh, but you just, it just means you have less capacity 
uh, and flexibility to fit time with God and to love and to serve others. Uh, Just because you've got pragmatic family concerns that you need to um, take care of as a priority. Uh, I've seen uh, some couples and singles take this to an extreme selfishly and just focus on their family and actually don't, they don't use their, uh, their marriage or their family to actually invite other people in that would really benefit from getting to know the couple and the family. But I actually think singles are at the greatest risk of selfishness because uh, we just don't have anyone, uh, usually, it's not always the case, but we don't usually have anyone to take care responsibility for on a daily basis. So then it's very easy to look at this passage and go, well, you singles, um, you need a lecture on how it's your duty to use your time and your energy for the kingdom of God. But I actually think we need to grasp the bigger picture of what's going on here. Um, You might, uh, I don't know whether you've um, uh, whether you've ever struggled with thinking, I know for me, I thought why, why marriage points to kind of marriage in the church uh, and it's this beautiful uh, picture of how there's the wedding supper of the lamb and we look forward to feasting together and it also points to the fact that uh, God has asked us to fulfill the creation mandate of fulfilling the earth uh, through procreation. But what about singleness? It kind of seems like the poor cousin and left out. What, does that point to anything? Well, uh, it does, and it's really beautiful. Um, it just it points to eternity, but it, it, it points to it in a different way to marriage. So in Matthew 22, when the Sadducees, they try to trap Jesus with uh, this concocted story about a woman who uh, she marries and then her husband dies, and that happens seven times. And then they try and say, well, you know, which um, husband is this woman going to be married into eternity? And Jesus says, well, actually, you don't know the scripture or the power of God. He says uh, that at the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. There aren't any special unions between two humans in heaven. We're actually all, as a corporate body, we're married to Christ. So this means that our siblinghood, being brothers and sisters in Christ, right now, that actually reflects our eternity together. And so while marriage is a foreshadow of eternity, in some way, the the siblinghood of singles right now, in that they have no special unions, that is kind of something almost more like a foretaste of eternity. You're living now as we will all live together for eternity. So you could almost say that singles are like threshold people. Their, their lives represent um, uh, this transparent window into what eternity is going to be like. Okay, and what about like the procreation um, image of, of marriage? Um, does that have any equivalent? Well, I think in, in Genesis 1, God does ask us to reproduce physically, but in the new covenant, our spiritual rebirth is what is emphasised. And so child rearing, we all know, is a great thing to do uh, as Christians, but that's actually not the end in itself. What we want to raise is more disciples of Jesus. And this is something that is universal. We're all called to spiritual parenthood, regardless of our marital status. Um, And so in some ways, singleness then comes with some unique privileges when it comes to spiritual parenthood, because... Uh, we have the freedom or the unhindered devotion to actually spend time with people of all ages and stages and family situations to help them from their spiritual infancy up to maturity in Christ. And so spiritual parenthood is not a consolation prize for people who can't kind of have real physical children, uh, but it's actually the true joy of every Christian who is fulfilling the gospel mandate. Isaiah 54.1 shares really nicely uh, a prophecy in some ways of this. It says, For the children of the desolate woman will be more than the children of the one who is married, says the Lord. So regardless sometimes of how we might feel we contribute to the kingdom of God as a single, uh, our existence in celibate singleness actually is a picture that points to our Uh, eschatological existence together. 
Uh, and so in some ways, a faithful singles Christian life is actually pointing to the fact that Jesus is so satisfying now uh, that sex is not essential because sex won't be a part of our future existence together as brothers and sisters in Christ for eternity. And so this really comes back to um, uh, the, the idea that singleness is not, it's not so much a duty to then uh, to go and build up the kingdom with your freedom in the Lord, but I think it's an absolute privilege uh, because your singleness is, is not, you shouldn't be perceived as kind of your usefulness to the Lord, a utilitarian view of your, your status, but actually your singleness is, uh, is it's part of, well, it points to many things, um, but see, some, like some singles won't actually have uh, more time than some parents to devote to the kingdom. Uh, and others, singles, actually have to rely on others for support. Uh, but still, their lives, trusting in Christ, point to eternity. And, but for many of us as singles, that extra time and energy we have, it's an opportunity for us, it's a privilege for us to throw ourselves into building God's kingdom. Uh, around the world, or here in Adelaide, uh, to people who haven't heard the gospel. So to just finish up, I just want to summarise some of the things that we've covered and maybe you could take one of these away, uh, hopefully as an encouragement, um, that singleness is a gift and marriage is a gift and both are good and blessings, uh, that we all need spirit-enabled uh, self-control to overcome sexual temptation. Uh, we all have sexual desires, but if you're really struggling with this area of sin in particular, then get help. Uh, find a brother or sister that you can confess to, set helpful boundaries and get habits. Uh, if you can legitimately marry, then perhaps consider that. Um, changing your status from married to single or vice versa, that won't make you more spiritual. It won't fix your life. Um, and you might consider delaying marriage due to a variety of situational factors. You may even legitimately consider not marrying for the sake of the kingdom. Uh, we need to be realistically aware that marriage brings a lot of extra responsibilities and complications, um, but uh, it's, it's still a great choice. Uh, both are great choices, um, if we have them. Um, marriage pictures our eternity with Christ, but so does singleness. And so regardless of whether we have physical children or not, we're to use our lives to strive to build up God's kingdom. Uh, to be spiritual parents... So whether single or married, are you daily growing in your relationship with God to help raise spiritual infants to maturity in Christ? Uh, let me finish with some prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you so much for the gifts of singleness and marriage, um, even if sometimes we struggle with them. Uh, we thank you for the community of brothers and sisters around us uh, and the Holy Spirit that helps us with sexual temptation. Uh, help us to realise that singleness and marriage both come with their privileges and complications and to support each other in different life circumstances within the body of Christ to, to be serving and loving each other. And just help us this week to take another step in our growth in godliness to be better equipped, to be spiritual parents, helping many people to find Jesus and to grow in him. Uh, we pray all these things in the authority of your name. Amen.